Hi, so now that we've established exactly what fish are, I wanted to get into one specific group of fish that we talk about, the cartilaginous fish. So again, when we say cartilaginous, we're referring to cartilage, like the material that your ear or nose is made out of. So when we talk about cartilaginous fish, the technical term we use for this grouping is chondrichthys. So this includes sharks, rays, and skates, so kind of these more flat, um, fish that we're looking at. Sawfish, again, they've got that saw-like nose. Guitarfish and chimeras, a type of deep sea fish. So like we said, the body structure is made out of cartilage. So the entire skeleton is made out of a flexible cartilage. So like we've compared to the human body and cartilage on ourselves, this allows these animals to be very flexible um, and it allows them to move at a decent speed because again, that tail has that cartilage base to it, and it um, makes it for a lot of sharks that they can travel at decent speeds when they need to to pursue, to pursue prey. So one thing that I want to highlight is what we talk about for dermal denticles and teeth, and I put that in air quotes because these two concepts are actually connected to one another. Dermal denticles are the scales, basically, of these different types of cartilaginous fish. If you've ever been to an aquarium that has an experience where you can pet sharks or rays, you've probably felt their skin and you thought, oh, it kind of feels like sandpaper. It's a little rough. That's because of these dermal denticles that are on the surface. Dermal denticles are essentially the same thing as teeth in these types of animals. They grow constantly. Um, they are always constantly replaced. The shark teeth are uh, modified in such a way so we see that they've got these constantly growing rows. Um, the way that they function as far as skin, they help provide streamlining for sharks and rays. Um, and it also has, because of that uneven texture, it seems like it has some properties that have made it harder for these animals to get infections. There are actually a lot of um, pieces of medical equipment and furniture that have been altered to have a surface that's a little bit more similar to shark skin. So thinking about what they eat, Obviously, most sharks, we tend to think of them as being top carnivores uh, that eat anything smaller than them. There are a couple of other varieties of feeding styles. When you think about skates and rays and other um, cartilaginous fish that travel more on the bottom, they have kind of flat mouth parts that shear and break open hard shells, again, for organisms that live on the seafloor. And then there are also types of sharks like the basking shark here or the whale shark that are very large, and they are filter feeders. They feed on very tiny microorganisms in the water like plankton. Even though the mouth is super duper big, their esophagus is only about the diameter of a quarter, so they aren't able to swallow very large prey. They can only swallow tons and tons of the small stuff to keep them going. So if you um, look at the presentation on Classroom, this video um, by Tierzu talks about um, different feeding styles in sharks, so it gives you a little bit more detail on that. This video is about shark locomotion. So if you watch that one, it talks a little bit about how their locomotion is different from other animals. Um, for cartilaginous fish in particular, the big thing I'd emphasize here is that they have a liver filled with oil. As we know, oil tends to rise above water. So their liver is what helps keep them buoyant, keeps them at a certain level in the water. Um, if it is a shark that likes to spend time toward the surface, they have a bigger liver and they stay up higher. If they tend to stay toward the bottom, they have a smaller liver that helps keep them lower down. Um, other than that, they still use their fins kind of like a plane uses its wings and things like that to help propel them through the water. Um, so consider that part. Look at this video on shark locomotion in the presentation. Skate and ray locomotion. Again, this is more um, talking about the way that they use their fins on the sides. It's a little bit unique compared to shark locomotion, so I'd recommend looking at that one as well. When we talk about the gills on these types of animals, again, um, we talk about having gill slits, so usually not a single gill. Um, shark and ray gills, for the most part, um, do not function in the same way that we think of most fish. Most fish can stay stationary, and they have operculum to help push water over their gills so that they can get oxygen. Most sharks and rays, unless they're designed for living in a stationary position toward the bottom, have to keep constantly moving through the water to get water to pass over their gills. So keep that in mind is another thing that's different about sharks um, compared to other types of fish. 
As far as defense mechanisms, we see a few different things here. Um, obviously, most people know about stingrays and their ability to sting. They basically have a barb here on their tail that can um, create a really sharp pain in anything that's trying to attack them, and they can whip that around with their tail. Um, when we talk about uh, camouflage, obviously we think of conventional camouflage, like just being able to blend into their environment. There's also a concept called countershading. So when we talk about countershading, we mean animals that are dark on the top, light on the bottom. And this is designed specifically for um, a lot of aquatic organisms. You see a lot of open ocean animals that have this color pattern. If you're looking at this animal from above it, and you're looking down toward the ground, that gray color will blend in a lot with the sea floor or the darkness that's further down where light isn't penetrating into the ocean. And if you're swimming underneath an animal like this and you're looking up, uh, again, that white underbelly will sometimes blend in with sunlight coming down. So again, it disguises that animal to where it's harder to perceive, which is important for how they track down prey. This video talks about the electric ray. So again, this is another defense mechanism slash attack strategy, being able to use electricity to grab prey and to fend off predators. So check out that video as well. Sensory organs, so this ties into a little bit of what we talked about with the electric array because there are what we call electroreceptors, so basically spots on the bodies of cartilaginous fish that pick up on electrical signals. When you see um, animals like the sawfish that have this super long nose, that nose is loaded up with lots of these electroreceptors. It helps them detect um, prey that's underneath the sandy bottom here that they can kind of dig out and then start to eat. Um, so electroreceptors, very useful for finding prey in total darkness or prey that's concealed or camouflaged. They have a lateral line. So again, lateral, we think about running parallel to the body. So it's a line that helps them detect things on either side of their body, especially movements in the water, changes in pressure, things like that. They also have excellent eyesight and sense of smell. So all those things help them with finding prey. For reproduction, <clears throat> When we talk about cartilaginous fish, they go through internal fertilization. So this means that the male has an intermittent organ. So here we're looking at a male and a female shark. The male has these two claspers. So this is an intermittent organ that they will insert into the cloaca of the female. And that is how they deposit sperm inside of them. So again, all the fertilization, eggs being turned into viable embryos happens internally. When they are actually ready to um, produce offspring. Some of them go through a live birth kind of process, and I put it in air quotes there because it's a little bit different than how mammals do it, or they will produce an egg case, or some people have maybe heard the term mermaid's purse if they've ever seen these in an aquarium. So here you can see a few different um, shapes for the egg cases. Here you can actually see a shark that's developing inside of one of them. Um, sometimes they will lay these egg cases and the mostly developed offspring will still take a little more time to develop before they hatch out. As far as the live birth goes, this last clip that we have on here is about a lemon shark giving live birth. So if you want to watch kind of how that looks, again, this is the little baby one and you can see it attached by that. It's kind of similar to an umbilical cord here to the mom. Um, so yeah, if you look through that video, you can see how live birth looks for a shark. So that's all that I wanted to cover as far as cartilaginous fish. So again, keep these characteristics in mind when we're talking about this specific group of fish.